Awesome. Awesome. And then Audrey, how do you say your last name? McClintock, right? Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. So you work for Padsplit. And then anyone that wants to, you know, buy a Padsplit or join it or has questions, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Audrey at Padsplit.com. It's A U D R E Y at P A D S P L I T dot com. Awesome. And so, yeah, the purpose of today is just to go over, um, like some good tips for someone that wants to buy a pad split, like some do's okay. and don'ts, um, especially more for beginners, probably like how, yeah. to, what the ideal property may look like. Sure. Um, let's start with location. I think that's probably the best place, um, to dive in. So really we want to, our demographic of tenants are hourly wage workers, right? They don't qualify for traditional housing for whatever reason, whether it be savings or um, income, right? They don't qualify income wise. Um, so a lot of people, it's really important for them to be close to where they work, right? So we think within, I would say a couple miles of where they work. So that's going to be huge location. Um, micro location is, is super important. Um, anywhere close to, let's say a shopping center, think Walmart, Costco, um, near hospitals is always great. Any time we're near an airport, that's great. Let's think like Amazon warehouses, like where are hourly wage workers working and then focus in those areas. Um, so the first thing actually that I like to do is when I find a property, I pull up the map to see exactly where it's located and see what's around it. So basically it looks like this. Um, this is a property that we have live on the platform. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I pull up the property and then I look to see what's what's around it. So you can see this this one has a Walmart very nearby, lots of fast food, family dollar, um, lots of shopping and places for people to, you know, places where hourly workers are working. Um, so this would be a good indication of like a what would be make a successful pad split. Mm -hmm. um, secondly. Uh, you want to focus on parking. So if you're going to convert a property into, let's say from a four bedroom to an eight bedroom, you have to assume that a lot of the tenants are going to have cars. So is this a neighborhood that is going to be okay with eight cars parked outside of, out of the home, right? So it's something that you really got to consider. Um, C-class neighborhoods work really, really well for us, kind of up and coming neighborhoods, you know, where probably the majority of them are investment properties, rentals. Um, you want to stay away from any sort of HOAs. Um, I would say any new construction subdivisions, anything like that. Um, neighbors can make it really difficult to operate a pad split. So selecting the right neighborhood is, is very important. And I actually can pull up a couple of neighborhoods and, and show you kind of an example of what I would consider a good neighborhood for a pad split. I've got a couple pulled up here. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of our tenants or members, they do rely on public transportation to get to and from. I know I probably don't want to walk further than a quarter mile to get to a bus stop. Um, so selecting a property that is within walking distance of a bus stop is super important. Also, you know, you can bet on half your tenants, about half your tenants, relying on the bus stop, which means less cars outside of the house, which is always great. So I would say if a bus stop is nearby, about half of your tenants will, will take the bus. Okay. Okay. Um, the next thing we can focus on is, um, the property specifically, actually. So I'll show you a couple of properties I have pulled up here that I think, well, they're really successful on the platform. So, um, and I think the neighborhood obviously has a lot to do with it. So you're with me here with the red house, correct? Yeah. Yeah. We okay. can see. So live property on the platform has eight bedrooms. I know it's tiny from the outside, but yes, there are eight bedrooms in this house. Um, if you look here, there's a bus stop right outside the front door. Oh, wow. Which is awesome. Yeah. And the property doesn't have a lot of parking. Um, you know, there's a bike lane here, so there's no park street parking. Really. You can come down this road and there are a few spots, but not really. So the majority of these tenants do take the bus. Okay. Um, 
but as you'll notice, it's kind of, you know, C-class neighborhood neighbors in this area probably are not going to notice or care if there's eight people living in this house. Right. Yeah. That makes um, sense. This property makes, it does really well for us. Um, and I think the neighborhood is just, is perfect. What would you say when, before you've done any renovations, what's like the ideal, like bed, bath, square foot, maybe like just rough. Roughly yes, speaking. we always want to start with either a 3-2 or a 4-2 and add rooms as needed. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a 4-to-1 ratio for bedrooms to bathrooms. So for every four bath be bedrooms, you need at least one bathroom. So if you start with a 3-2 or a 4-2, you know you have the capacity to go to eight. Um, I would focus on properties with 1,700 square feet or more in order to maximize the space to get the amount of bedrooms that you're going to need in order for this property to cash flow the way you want it to. And then what would you say is the target bed bath, like after renovations without going too high, like where it's maybe overcrowded, the sweet spot, what would you say? Yeah. So this is a really good slide that kind of demonstrates that. So our sweet spot, a good rule of thumb for me and what I like to tell investors is you know, four to five rooms is, is going to cover your nut, right? So your bills, you can probably consider your bills paid within four to five bedrooms. Anything on top of that is where you start to see the cash flow. I think the sweet spot is about between about five to eight rooms. This slide says five to seven. Um, I think five to eight is a good, a good number. Anything on top of that, you're going to see a lot of turnover probably, you know, with nine or more people living in a house. Yeah. Um, it's, not going to be as cozy and comfortable. People are going to stay for shorter periods of time. Um, we like to say that we offer clean, safe, and functional housing. I think functionality is the biggest thing um, to focus on as the as the investor and making sure that the property layout makes sense for this many people um, living under one roof. And and what's gonna what can you do that will um, you know get people to stay a long time? So I think. Five to eight roommates is plenty. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, and they um, let's see, they also just made the recent changes too, like to help incentivize people to stay longer. I don't remember exactly what it is. Yeah. I read it. We just implemented this um earlier this week, actually. Um, we are now requiring a 12-week commitment from the uh members. So when they sign up, they'll either they'll either commit to the 12 weeks or they'll commit to a flexible option. Um, if they commit to a flexible option, they have to pay $175 upfront, which goes directly to the host. That's going to offset that 10 day fee, um, that our 10 day fee upfront that we require. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, you're also going to set your, um, your move-in fee, your booking fee. So it, most people set that between 75 and $150. So that right there, is going to cover our 10 day fee. Should someone move out before, you know, after the, they're still required to stay 31 days, but if they do sh stay shorter than three months, it should offset that, that fee. Yeah, and we, yeah. we really did that with the fee model change. It just made sense. Um, so I think, I think hosts are going to really like that. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I have a couple questions, but I can wait. Okay. I don't want to mess, mess with your flow or anything. No, go ahead. Um, this basically this slide just outlines why five to seven rooms make sense. Um, you're going to see high returns. Obviously, the renovation costs are going to be lower, less less bad, less bedrooms, um, and then also less neighbor complaints. You know, let's keep it below. I think nine bedrooms. Otherwise, neighbors are going to be like, "What's you know? Why are twelve people living in this house?" Um, and you know, your costs are going to be low. Your utilities are going to be low, low. It all kind of will end up kind of leveling out and being the same, given yeah. that. Um, I think the last two questions are kind of more on the little more advanced side, like intermediate, but mm -hmm. the first one, what would you say is obviously no HOA, but what are some extra tips on how to like stay out of the radar of the city? Like no one wants to fight the city. Um, of like just compliance, like stuff like that. What have you noticed? Like the, the hosts that are doing very well, how they've just continued to run smoothly and not bump heads with the city or County. The biggest part is just like that upfront sourcing, following the buy box, the people who have run into issues and there's not many of them. They are the ones that are making the most noise, obviously, but they didn't follow the buy box. 
Um, they did not find a property in a neighborhood that is a C-class neighborhood. Um, we had someone who bought a property in a historic neighborhood and um, it ended up in, on the news in Atlanta because people that live in a historic neighborhood don't, you have to ask permission to put a fountain in your backyard. Why would they allow a pad split, right? So no. um, parking is also probably the biggest red flag, I would say for um, the property success. Um, if you can extend the parking the um if you can extend the driveway in and behind the house put cars behind the house if you can add a driveway on the other side um if you you know you can set up your property too and say there's only four allowed parking spots which a lot of hosts don't don't realize that my house comes with four parking spots once those are full um people with cars cannot book the house um otherwise they're subject to street parking and we'll have to figure it out or you can say um, you know, no, no more cars available. And then they have people that rely on the bus will, will book your home. So, um, that's a big thing. And then, you know, just trash management, making sure you have clear instructions in the, um, in your house manual. And then also we send out reminders to make sure trash is being managed properly. That's another one. That's a red flag. Just keep the property, you know, the, the lawn mode, things like that. Just keep the property up to par and make sure that you are being a good neighbor and you won't have any issues. Nice. Nice. And then the last one is one I'm personally curious about is if I'm looking to buy a turnkey pad split, what does that look like? I know outside the normal, like, you know, making sure title's clean. How can I make sure that that host maybe isn't in the middle of a fight or something with the city, like they didn't do everything you just said and mm -hmm. they, they're just trying to get out of it. And, but I, I, it'd be hard for me to know. So other than like yeah. maybe making sure permits were used, how could I yeah. protect that? It person? would be hard for pads to know why they wanted to sell unless the property is just not doing well. Right. And you right. should always ask financials. Let's understand how this property is performing. I think that's really important. I've done a couple resales and a lot of times the host is selling because they just need to liquidate, right? They just need some, they need cash. Yeah. Um, and um, they, they are, they can be a, a good, easy um, entry into pad slit, right? They kind of cut out all the, all the upfront work that you need to do. Um, however, you know, understanding if they have any like pending citations or any, anything like that, I think you can pull all of those records and understand like what, what is, are there any pending situations? Like you can pull a title report, um, things like that. But yeah, I would really do your research and get to the bottom of like, why are you actually selling is going to be, is going to be important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause we, there's a couple we've thought about buying and I just, we're going to probably buy a turnkey one. Like we have a rehab going on now, Port Orange, but there's been a few turnkey ones that a couple partners and I were thinking about buying together. And I just, before we do, I want to make sure I got my, my checklist lined out. Yeah. I think just running the numbers, I know, um, it's gonna be important to, you know, you're buying at a premium probably, right. A lot of them are selling at 10% at a 10% premium. So it's like, do they still cash flow? It's going to be an important piece as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, that's awesome. Are there any last like golden nuggets that you think anyone for that wants to buy maybe their first or second pad split that you think they should know that we didn't go over? Um, definitely work with your AE. Um, we have some really good tools that allow you to, you know, help make sourcing a lot easier and understanding what makes a good pad split. And then your dedicated AE can get second eyes on it and, um, you know, help you understand if this is going to be a good purchase for, for a pad split. Um, we also have uh, vendors on the ground that are going to help them get from A to Z. So literally we have wholesalers in every market that can help them acquire a property. Mm -hmm. We have GCs in every market that are going to help them get it renovated. Um, we have a property manager that can literally take over from the GC, get it completely furnished and listed. Um, so, I mean, if you you can be as hands off as you want to be, and we'll make it as easy for you as, as you want to be. And I don't think a lot of people realize that it can seem very overwhelming and like a lot of, a yeah. lot of effort up front, but it really doesn't have to be. That's awesome. And then, do you work? I like guess someone wants to reach out to you, like through the email you mentioned earlier. They want to like get their first pad split with you. Do you work just in Florida, or are you anywhere? 
Yeah, I'm I'm nationwide. Um, I do focus in Florida, but I do deals all over the country and can help um, can help anybody. It's it's just really about putting them in, in touch with those local vendors. Um, I think would be the biggest piece. But yeah, happy to help um, help with wherever they want to invest. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Could you say your email one last time? Yeah, it's Audrey, A-U-D-R-E-Y at padsplit.com. Reach out to me and we'll we'll connect and we'll set up a call. Perfect. Yeah, if you're okay, then I'm going to um I'm gonna put this like publish this video. Okay. I'm gonna stop recording real quick. And then I'm gonna do a, a LinkedIn article if you're okay with it as well. Yeah, 